In this video, we're going to take a look at the definite and indefinite integrals of the functions cosine squared x and sine squared x. And first, we're going to put some terminology on the table. So let's talk about sinusoidal functions. Sinusoidal functions are just going to be functions whose formula has a certain type, and that type is a plus b sine of c times x minus d, which looks a lot more frightening in generality than in particular examples. So let's take a moment to um, unwind this formula and we're going to recall some basic facts from pre-calculus about shifting and stretching functions. So what we're really doing here is we're taking the basic sine curve and we're going to stretch it vertically a bit through the coefficient b. We're going to stretch it horizontally a bit through the coefficient c. The coefficient a is going to shift the graph vertically and the coefficient d is going to shift the graph horizontally. So for example, sine of x plus pi over 2 being a sine graph shifted over is going to be sinusoidal, but that's just the cosine graph. So guess what? Cosine itself is sinusoidal. So if we revisit this definition, we realize that any function you can create by taking the same template but using cosine instead of sine is actually also a sinusoidal function. So you might think that there'd be such a thing as cosinusoidal, which you could make that definition, but there's really no point in making such a definition because you can just wrap it up into sinusoidal. So just remember that when I refer to a sinusoidal function, what I'm really saying is take your favorite sine or cosine graph, stretch it, shift it, and get a new graph and all these functions we're going to call sinusoidal. So there's a huge family of such functions, you know, basically just uh, there, there are these periodic functions that look like sine and they can have various amplitudes and periods and that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's be a little more specific about the ingredients here. So the Line y equals a constitutes what we'll call the baseline of the function. It's sort of the, the base around which the graph is going to oscillate. The amplitude of the graph is given by the absolute value of b. The period of the graph is given by the quantity 2 pi over absolute value of c. d, by the way, controls how far along the horizon you shift your graph. Now, all of these should be familiar to you, and if, if they're not quite familiar to you, you should probably go back and do a little review of your basic pre-calculus shifting and stretching skills. Now, sinusoidal functions have many different symmetries. So, for example, it has translational symmetry. The graph of a sinusoidal function looks the same whenever it is shifted integral multiples of its period. So you can shift it left and right, and as long as you're sort of matching up the periods, you get the same graph back. That's what we mean by a symmetry. It's something you can do to the graph and then not have the appearance of it change. But there's more than translational symmetry. It also has reflectional symmetry. We picked this one relative max, but of course we could move over to a relative min and do the same thing. We can reflect the graph and have it look the same after the fact. And in fact, the graph of a sinusoidal function looks the same whenever it's flipped across a vertical line through a relative extremum. But that's not all. A sinusoidal graph has rotational symmetry. And once again, you can pick various points around which you can rotate the graph 180 degrees. So the lesson here is the graph of a sinusoidal function looks the same whenever it's rotated 180 degrees about a baseline point. Now, all of these symmetries, all these facts, can be proved rigorously using standard trig identities that you should understand and know. For example, the identity sine of x plus 2 pi equals sine x, that's what leads to the translational symmetry. The fact that sine is odd, sine of negative x equals negative sine x, that actually leads to the rotational symmetry about the origin. And the fact that sine of pi minus x is equal to sine x, that leads to a reflection symmetry about the vertical line x equals pi over 2. And then mixing these results, you can show that uh, these symmetries occur at all the places indicated in the previous slides. We're not going to prove these facts, but we are going to use them in what follows. Now, let's take a look at cosine squared x. Let's try to understand better what this function 
um, what the graph of this function really looks like. So what we'll do first is we'll plot cosine x. And we're going to make some observations. Wherever the value of cosine x was 0, well, of course, when you square that, you're still going to get 0. So these points belong to the graph of cosine squared. At the relative extremum, where the graph of the values of the function cosine are 1, well, of course, you square 1, you're still going to get 1. So we're going to have those points on the graph of cosine squared. And wherever the value of cosine was negative 1, if we square these values, you're going to get 1. So these points should be on the graph of cosine squared x. And already you have a pretty good skeleton of what the graph looks like. And we can guess that cosine squared x is going to look something like this. We know that the graph, for instance, can never dip below the horizontal axis because the values have to be non-negative. And, you know, if you just sort of look at it, you realize, boy, there's a chance that cosine squared x itself appears to be sinusoidal. So we're going to prove that. And we're going to start with the double angle identity for cosine. What is cosine of 2x equal to? Well, it's equal to cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And now we can replace sine squared x with 1 minus cosine squared x, the so-called Pythagorean identity. Now, if you clean this up a little bit, you're going to get 2 cosine squared x minus 1. And now all you have to do is solve for cosine squared x. And you're going to get this formula right here. Now, what's intriguing about this is it is, in fact, a sinusoidal function. We've taken the graph of cosine and stretched it and shifted it. So the baseline of this function is in fact at the line y equals 1 half. The amplitude is 1 half and the period is pi. So cosine squared x is in fact sinusoidal and it has these characteristics. Moreover, we can play the same game to find out that sine squared x is also sinusoidal. And if we look at a graph of sine squared x, we see very similar properties. Baseline at a half, amplitude at a half, and period pi. So let's talk about the indefinite integral of cosine squared x. It turns out this is a surprisingly sneaky antiderivative to calculate. You can't just simply say take one third sine cubed, you might think that's the obvious candidate, but if you try taking the derivative of one third sine cubed, you'll see that the chain rule sort of spoils your efforts. Um, it's just surprisingly tricky to do this antiderivative. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in the formula we just derived for cosine squared. Cosine squared x is equal to one half plus one half cosine two x. Now this is a formula whose antiderivative we can readily find. Antiderivative of 1 half is 1 half x. Antiderivative of cosine is sine. We have to take into account the chain rule because of the 2x on the inside. So you get this antiderivative right here. Cosine squared's antiderivative is 1 half x plus 1 quarter sine 2x. And similarly, the antiderivative for sine squared x can be found. And we get this formula. So here are these two formulas for the antiderivatives of cosine squared and sine squared. Now let's just check. There's a little bit of internal checking we can do to make sure that these are consistent with each other at least. What happens if we try to add these two formulas together? So first of all, let's rename the constants c1 and c2 so we don't conflate the two constants. They're different constants of integration for both, both of these uh, operations. Now we're going to add the columns on the left and we'll get the sum of these two antiderivatives and then on the right side, we see there's some cancellation, and we just get x plus a couple of constants. And of course, the, the two constants together, we can sort of glom together and call that constant c. Now, the intriguing thing to notice is that the left-hand side can be rewritten. That's the antiderivative of cosine squared plus sine squared, which, of course, is just the constant function 1. So look at what we have. The antiderivative of the constant function 1 is just x, which, of course, is correct. So these two formulas are certainly consistent with each other, which is nice. Now, let's take a look at an example of definite integration. Suppose we want to take the definite integral of cosine squared x from 0 to pi over 3. Well, we have our formula to um, rewrite cosine squared x as a sinusoidal function, and then we can find the antiderivative, plug in the endpoints, and in the end we get pi over 6 plus root 3 over 8. So now let's talk about sinusoidal symmetry and definite integration. The calculation we just did was nice, but sometimes you want to take a moment before you launch into the fundamental theorem. So we're going to take a look at cosine squared x 
And what if we had wanted to find the definite integral of cosine squared x on the interval from 0 to pi over 2? What's that value? Now, before we substitute in our formula and find the antiderivative, plug in the endpoints, let's just think about this for a second. There's a rectangle here whose area is pi over 2. And because of the symmetry of this sinusoidal graph, we realize that the two regions that are shaded in this picture must be the same. They're equal to each other, and therefore they add up to pi over 2. In other words, the area we're looking for is pi over 4. So you notice what happened there. It was the rotational symmetry about that baseline point that enabled us to conclude that the area we were looking for was pi over 4. Nice trick. Saves us a lot of work. And it's not just this interval. There are all sorts of other intervals where this works. Because of the reflectional symmetry and translational symmetry, we can basically build up tiles to figure out all sorts of definite integrals. For example, what's the definite integral of cosine squared x from negative pi to pi? So we take a look at this, and you'll notice that if we had this rectangle whose area is 2 pi, then the area we're actually looking for has to be 1 half of that. And so, in this case, the definite integral is just pi. A word of warning is in order, though. This trick can only be used on authorized intervals only. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to our example from 0 to pi over 3. You might say, hey, this is a great trick. Let's just find the area of the rectangle and cut it in half. Well, in this case, that would give you pi over 6. But it's pretty obvious that that's not the answer we're looking for because pi over 6 is the area of that triangle right there. Symmetry just doesn't apply in this case. There's no rotational, reflectional symmetry that we're going to use to simplify this process of integration. So what you're going to have to do is go back to the fundamental theorem in this case. Not so bad, but a little bit more work than certainly being able to just find areas of rectangles and cutting them in half. So there you go. The antiderivative of cosine squared and sine squared can easily be obtained through the double angle formula for cosine. If you need to use the fundamental theorem, then you can use the fundamental theorem for definite integrals, but keep your eyes open for symmetry to make your definite integration much, much simpler.